53 through 58. And when Jesus had finished these parables, he went away from there. And coming to his hometown, he taught them in, his, in their synagogue, so that they were astonished and said, Where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And are not all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown and in his own household. And he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Amen. Aaron? Well, as... Um as Eden said, today we're going to finish up chapter 13, and then we will. I'm not sure. Okay, I am. Uh, and then we'll we'll go through chapter 14. Then we're going to take after chapter 14, we're going to take a little break from the Gospel of Matthew and do some other things. Um, but today, uh, before we go to prayer, uh, let me just say a couple of things. If you're new to our church, uh, we typically preach through books of the Bible. We've been working our way uh, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, through the Gospel of Matthew. And so I'm excited to look at these brief few verses that, that we just read a moment ago. Uh, but before we do that, I want to uh, mention something to you that you, you really need to know about. One of our ministry partners, Chris McMillan, who is the president of International Teaching and Equipping Ministries, um, Chris has preached here multiple times, you know, just to, to, to serve here. He was part of Theology Week. Um, please pray for Chris because Chris has to have open heart surgery uh, as you know, Chris had a stroke, a pretty significant stroke a while back, a few months ago, but he's been having some other complications uh, since then, and um, everything he's tested for said his heart was fine, but he mentioned he had this one little thing going on, and uh, just kind of a little phantom pain that would come and go. Anyway, he told the doctor about it, and doctor, that was a warning sign for the doctor. The doctor said, we need to get you in to have tests. So it turns out that he has severe blockages in at least three places, and they're going to do open heart uh, bypass uh, surgery. Uh, I don't have a date for that yet, but it's going to be soon. And uh, I want us, we love Chris. Chris is a good brother, um, and he's a personal friend of mine. So can we just together, let's just pray for Chris right now, because this is a big deal. And I pray for his wife, Allison, too. Father, we just want to lift up Chris to you this morning. Um, God, we are so grateful that he did not have a, a massive heart attack while he was out on the mission field. But we know that this is certainly complicating his ministry. Uh, his ministry is a faith-based ministry, and, and, and it means that if uh, he's not able to get out and share with people the work that he's doing, that he's not able to, to, to have the funds to go on mission trips and to pay his salary and all those kinds of things that come with that, and I know that creates a lot of anxiety in him. It creates a lot of anxiety in Allison. And so, Father, we just pray that, uh, that he'll be able to have this surgery soon and that it will be a complete success, that he'll have uh, a full recovery. In fact, that his recovery uh, will be better than even is anticipated. Uh, Lord, help him to not be anxious during this time. Help Allison also to trust you. God, we just pray that, that everything will go well with them. This has been a, a very difficult season in their lives. Not only have they dealt with illness, but they've, their parents have also had illnesses on, on both sides of their families. And so there's been a lot on their plates. And I just, Lord, as a church family, I want us to pray this morning, just intercede for them, that you give grace to them, strength to them, uh, that, you, um, that you give healing to Chris through the hands of doctors and medicine, that you raise him up, that he can continue to do the good work the good gospel ministry that he's been doing. That's where his heart is. That's where you've been blessing and using him. And we just pray that that work will continue to, to prosper and grow. Lord, help him this morning to know that his brothers and sisters at Temple Baptist Church love him. We're praying for him. Lord, give peace to his heart. Give strength to his body. Uh, help him to trust in your promises. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And if you know Chris, let me just encourage you, reach out to him, send him an email, a text message, let him know you love him, you're praying for him and his wife. Well, this morning we're looking at uh, 
Familiarity breeds contentment. We're looking at the hometown rejection of Jesus. And to get us started this morning, I want to tell a story from the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, uh, Aaron, the high priest, had two sons. You may remember this story. It's the story of Nadab and Abihu. Uh, in Exodus chapter 24, Nadab and Abihu received, you might call it, an amazing once-in-a-lifetime kind of opportunity. They went up on the mountain with Moses and with Aaron and saw God. The text actually says they saw God and they ate and they drank in His presence. Let that just sink in. Who gets to do that? Who gets an opportunity as amazing as that? They saw God and they ate and they drank in His presence. What a splendid privilege these two men were given. But if you keep reading, sometimes later, you find that Nadab and Abihu treated the Lord with contempt. How so? Well, they offered strange fire, unauthorized fire, on the, off, on the altar for the offerings of the Lord. And the Scripture says that it angered God, and God consumed them with blazing fire for their actions. Now, for many of us, that, that seems like a divine overreaction. I mean, why would God do that? Why, who cares about where the fire comes from? I mean, fire is just fire to us. And we don't have time to dig deeply into this story, but let me make a, a couple of just observations, and then we'll move on. It does matter what we do when we come into the presence of God. We must come before Him in a way that is consistent with His will and His revelation. Anybody who tells you, anybody who says to you, you know what, God doesn't really care about that. He doesn't really care about how you worship Him. He doesn't care about those little details. That's somebody that's not actually read the Bible. God greatly cares about how we worship Him. And we must worship Him in truth, in accordance to how He has revealed Himself and how He has instructed. Now, there's more to that story. Let me just mention this. It's possible, actually, that Nadab and Abihu were actually intoxicated when they made the offering of strange fire on the altar. Just a few verses down after this event where God strikes them dead, we read these words. God says to Aaron, you and your sons are to, to not drink wine or other fermented drink whenever you go into the temple of meeting, that is the place that's offered where they offer sacrifices, or if you do, you will die. This is a lasting ordinance for the generations to come so that you, and listen to this, why does he not want them to be drunk when they're, when they're performing their priestly duties? Here's what he tells them. So you can distinguish between the holy and the common, between the, the unclean and the clean. So apparently these men were drunk when they were performing their priestly duties. They were not in control of their thoughts, and this led to their blasphemous disregard for the prescriptions that God had ordained. See, somewhere along the way, Nadab and Abihu forgot what was truly important. They had known a privilege that no other human beings had known to be in the presence of God, and, and just a short time later, they took it all for granted, and they treated sacred things with contempt. You know, that old saying, familiarity breeds contempt, means it means that knowing someone or something very well can lead to a lack of respect or appreciation for them. And so over time, constant exposure can cause one to take a person or a thing for granted, often resulting in disdain or disregard. And this is exactly what happened in Nadab and Abihu. By the way, this is exactly what we will see happen in Jesus' life as he returns to his hometown here of Nazareth. Their familiarity with Jesus leads them to treat Him as merely common, failing to see Him for who He truly is. But let me just say to you, as we, get, we dig into this passage, we're going to go pretty quickly through this. This is a short passage, and I think I'll preach a little shorter. I don't know. I'm going to try. I don't know. I always say I am, especially on Lord's Supper Sundays. I'm like, I'm going to preach short, but mm, just, it just never works out. Uh, but let me just say, this passage also, I think, has a warning to us. Uh, Jesus must never become common or ordinary to you or to me. 
Like Nadab and Abihu, we must not treat what is sacred as common. Our love and our devotion to Jesus should increase as our knowledge of Him grows. So, here's the main idea this morning I want to get across in this message. In one sentence, familiarity with Jesus should deepen our faith, not diminish it. Familiarity with Jesus should deepen our faith, not diminish it. And we're going to take this passage, this brief passage, we're going to break it down into three short sections. We're going to look at, first of all, Jesus returned to Nazareth. That's verses 53 and the first part of verse 54. Then secondly, we're going to look at Jesus' rejection in Nazareth. And then finally, we're going to look at Jesus' response to Nazareth. So let's look at that first point there again. Jesus returned to Nazareth. Now, there's something about going home, I think, that's just comforting. I don't know. It's just nice. Uh, If you're not from Virginia and you get to go home, typically that's a good experience, I think, for most people. We look forward to going back. Uh, I know when I grew up, I'm from the great state of North Carolina, down on the East Coast, a little community called Smyrna. And uh, I, when I turned 18, I went off to Bible college. I couldn't wait to get away. I, like most young people, I was like, sayonara. I'm ready to see the world. I'm ready to see something new. Went off to college. And you know what happened? In, in a little, just a short amount of time, I started thinking about home. And I started going, man, I can't believe I, I, miss, I miss Smyrna of all places. I miss being back home. And, and I found myself, <coughs> excuse me, I found myself, I got a cough here. I found myself, you know, looking forward to, to going home and seeing family and friends and you know, eating in my, my favorite restaurants. You know, I c- couldn't wait to get home and have some good fried shrimp, uh, some core sound clam chowder. You know, that's the right way to eat clam chowder, by the way. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you've got to look it up. Core sound clam chowder. Uh, none of this New England and Manhattan abominations. The right way is core sound. Uh, and, and, and hush puppies. Hush puppies. And, and I know you can go anywhere and get hush puppies. But I'm just going to, I know this is sound biased, but the best place to get hush puppies is Carter County, North Carolina. They are unique. Even that guy, um, Guy, how do you say his last name? Yeah, that dude. That guy even did a special show about how the hush puppies are made from Moorhead City, North Carolina. So I'm just telling you, I'm right on this, y'all. Trust me. And, uh, and it's just the best. And, and so I loved going home and just, you know, hanging out with friends, seeing the old landmarks of my youth. Have I done something wrong? Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much for that. I do appreciate that. Um, and I imagine Jesus probably had some good memories growing up in a small community um, like Nazareth. In Jesus' day, Nazareth was mostly a Jewish settlement. They had about 1,500 people in it. Now, today, it's radically different from that. It's known as the Arab capital of Israel. It's a sizable city. It's got about 80,000 people in it. About 70% of those people are Muslim, and about 30% of those people are Arab Christian. And there's almost no Jews that live in Nazareth today. Now, after Jesus' extended teaching time, uh, in chapter 13, he decides to get on the road and head home to Nazareth. And in fact, all three not, uh, synoptic gospels record Jesus ministering there. Uh, he, you might remember, he's born in Bethlehem, but then his family moved to Nazareth. And so it's possible that this, this event that Matthew records for us is the same as the one that Luke records in Luke chapter 4, although I don't think it probably is. I think it's a different, a different visit, but we can't be entirely sure. But what does Jesus do when he gets to his hometown? Does he go and say, hey, I want to hang out with my high school friends? Does he say, you know, you know what, I, I, tell, tell folks I'm on vacation, I don't have time to meet with them? Nope, nope. You'll notice here he goes straight to the synagogue to teach God's Word to the people. The synagogue was the centrally important uh, place where God's people gathered. It was sort of like church. You went there to, to worship, to study the Scriptures, to fellowship with other believers. And it was common for the, the, the ruler of the synagogue to ask guest teachers if they would like to preach. And so I'm sure Jesus understood this. He knew this opportunity. He took advantage of it. And so he stands up to address the people and, and has some things to say to them. Which brings us to the second part here of the, of the text because 
Uh, this occasion, this joyous occasion of the hometown boy returning turns sour very quickly. We're going to look at Jesus' rejection here in Nazareth. And Matthew records that the people were astonished by Jesus. They're, they're listening to him teach, and they've seen him minister, and they are astonished. And they, they ask a series of six questions. Six questions. And each of these questions, we learn important details about Jesus. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at question number one, and then we're just kind of bundle the rest of the questions, two through six together. All right, so question number one, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? How in the world does this ordinary guy speak like this with such wisdom and insight? How can he perform such miracles? They undoubtedly heard of Jesus performing miracles in other places, uh, his reputation preceded him, but he also, the text tells us in, in, in the Gospels, that he did do some miracles in Nazareth, so they cannot deny the fact of these, the miracles that Jesus has done. The only question is the source. Where does he get this stuff from? Does it come from God, or does it come from the devil? Jesus received no rabbinical training, so how in the world can he do these things? So that's the question there. And then you look at questions two through six, and basically here's what you see. They go, is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? Uh, this is not Judas Iscariot, by the way. It's a different Judas. And, and are these not his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? Now, you'll notice the details here. Not only do they know Jesus, but they know his family. They know his dad, Joseph, the village carpenter. And a carpenter would have been a well-known individual in a small community like that. And Matthew, you'll notice here, he's included the other details. They, they, they know his mom by name. They know his siblings by name. This is a well-known, large, established Jewish family in a small community. Now, here's an interesting, I think, I think it's an interesting question for us to consider. What did Jesus do in the early years of his life? before he started his earthly ministry. What did he do? You'll notice the Bible doesn't say a whole lot about that. I mean, there are a few things that we can learn from the Gospels that, that he did. Uh, in Luke's Gospel, we see a few of those details. Um, and there are some things that we can glean about what his life would have been like based off of our understanding of, of a typical Jewish family in the culture and the, and the, uh, the, the, the age of that time. But that being said, it's not enough for some people. There are some people uh, in history who wanted more details about what Jesus did in his early life. So what they did is they just kind of created all of these really fanciful stories about his childhood. For example, as a young Christian, I was given a book that contained Jesus' apocryphal uh, infancy narratives. Now, I had, as a, a boy of 13 or 14 years of age, I had no idea, idea that these stories were actually not part of the scriptures. The book was, that was given to me, it was given to me, I think, by my grandmother. The, the title of it was something like The Lost Books of the Bible. Well, you know, that immediately made me think that these, these stories are true and that somebody has hidden them from us. Somebody has taken all of these stories out of our Bibles, and so now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find out because this is, you know, this is deeply disturbing to me that somebody would, would hide something about Jesus from us. And so in the, uh, in the apocryphal infancy narratives of Jesus, uh, he is depicted as what I would call sort of like a, I don't know, like a, like a young Jedi. You know, he's, he, he, he's kind of got these powers that he doesn't fully know how to control yet, and he doesn't have the, the moral, I don't know, the moral foundation, if you would, to, to distribute them properly. He doesn't have the moral compass to, to use them well. I remember reading one disturbing story in particular. This one really bothered me as a kid. In the story, uh, a little boy bumps into Jesus, just accidentally bumps into Jesus, and Jesus gets so angry at the little boy that he strikes him dead. Yeah. Now, at such a young age of 13 or 14, I didn't know much about the Bible, and I didn't know much about theology, but I knew enough to understand that Jesus was supposed to be without sin, and he was also supposed to be pretty nice. And that story kind of undermined both of those for me. It caused a lot of doubt. 
And there are a lot of other bizarre and disturbing stories in the apocryphal infancy narratives of Jesus. For example, uh, a child took a stick, he, he, he knocked over the bottle of water or the, the water that Jesus had collected, and the boy Jesus got so angry, angry with this kid that he called him, quote, a godless, brainless moron. And this struck him dead, causing his body to wither like a corpse. When Joseph and Mary's neighbors complain, Jesus miraculously strikes them blind. Jesus starts receiving lessons from, from teachers of the law, but then he starts teaching the teachers, and, and this upsets the teacher who's like, hey, there's something supernatural going on with this kid. He resurrects a friend who is, who is killed when he falls off a roof. He heals another who has his foot cut with an axe. He heals his brother who's bitten by a venomous snake, and two others who have died from different illnesses. As a child, he makes clay birds, and then he breathes life into them and causes them to live and fly away. It's like crazy stories. Now, if you don't hear anything else I say, please understand, these are not true. These are not biblical stories. And, and by the way, this is why as parents and grandparents, we have to be very discerning about the things we let our children read and what we give them. But here's the, why, you, why am I sharing all of that? Here's the deal. Jesus had such a basic and ordinary life that apparently he did nothing memorable to the people of Nazareth or for the people of Nazareth. I mean, we know that all of these fanciful stories that I just told you are not true. And by the way, historians and theologians and scholars don't believe they're true either. But we don't need scholars and historians to, to prove to us that those stories I just shared with you are false. All we need to do is look at our Bibles. All we need to do is look at the people's reaction when he returns to Nazareth. I mean, if Jesus had done all those scary and weird things as a kid, everybody would still be talking about them. I mean, you can't go home and people don't remind you of the stuff you did as a kid, right? Yeah. And the reaction, if he had done all of those things, the reaction would have been quite different when he showed up at the synagogue that day. I mean, it would have been like, hey, keep your distance. <laughs> he likes his space, apparently, so don't bump into him and, and don't touch his bottle of water. I mean, that would have been kind of the conversation. But it wasn't. Jesus was born approximately 6 B.C. He began his ministry around 28 A.D., which means that he was in his early 30s when he started his earthly ministry. So before starting his earthly ministry, I ask you again, what was Jesus doing growing up? What was his life like? What did he do? And again, based off of the Gospels and based off of our understanding of Jewish culture and society in the first century, we can glean some ideas about that. Well, for example, being from a, a typical religious Jewish family, he would have attended synagogue worship with them. Uh, and, and we know from Luke's Gospel he did. In fact, it was his custom to go into the synagogue. He would have participated in all the religious holidays and festivals of his faith. He would have served with Joseph, his father, learning the family business. In those days and in that culture, there's no such thing as economic mobility where you could go out and find yourself and, and, and switch gears and, and choose a different career. If your father was a carpenter, guess what? You were a carpenter. If your daddy was a fisherman, you're going to be a fisherman. And you know what? Your sons are going to be fishermen as well. Most scholars believe that Joseph died early in Jesus' life, which means... As the firstborn son, it would have been his responsibility to take over the family business as the village carpenter. And so all of these things would have been the daily rhythm and, and routine that defined Jesus' life. Bottom line is simply this. In all these years, Jesus didn't do anything apparently particular. Uh, he didn't apparently do anything that was particularly special to show that he was a Messiah or anything out of the ordinary. He wasn't going around turning clay birds into real ones or striking people dead in anger or turning classmates into mummies because they offended him. We want to know more details about Jesus' childhood and youth, but the truth is that the early life of Jesus was just uneventful, bland, and boring. 
I mean, look at what the people are saying here. We know this boy. He's one of us. We've watched him grow up. We know his mama and his daddy. We know his brothers and his sisters by name. Uh, we know he's, he's a decent carpenter. I mean, he built a couple of chairs for my table, um, you know, but that's about it. He's got no rabbinic training. There ain't nothing special about him. And then we get to verse 57, and we see a sad verse. Verse 57 says, and they took offense at him. Six, six words, six of the saddest words you could say in Scripture. And they took offense at him. Amazement turns to skepticism and then to opposition. By the way, the word there for offense means more than merely personally offended. It denoted total rejection of Jesus. They, in other words, they consider him to be a false prophet. Which brings us to the third movement here in the text, and that is Jesus' response to Nazareth. This encounter leads Jesus to say something. He says, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and in his own household. The people couldn't accept that Jesus was anything special. There, there's just no way he's the Messiah. We know him. He's the carpenter's son. And that prejudice kept them from entering the kingdom. And the result of their unwillingness to believe and to follow him is seen in verse 58. Jesus, and it says in verse 58, and he, meaning Jesus, did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Now, there's a right way that you understand verse 58. And here it is. Jesus' power is not limited by the people as though he can't do miracles. It's not like Jesus is sitting there going, I want to do more, but you guys have somehow tied my hands. No, no, no. Instead, you should understand, as we see in the Gospels, that Jesus demanded faith, and rather he would not act because of their unbelief. In other words, Jesus chose not to do greater works there. In other accounts of Jesus' visits in Nazareth, we find that the people demanded miracles. That's very explicit in Luke 4. They, they, they want him to do miracles. They had heard about his miracle working ministry in other places, and so prove yourself. Do it here. Do it among us. But Jesus is he's not a circus performer. He doesn't do miracles on demand. In fact, he rebukes the Jews for demanding signs and miracles. And as I have stated before, yes, Jesus do, did do miracles. He did heal people, and those were acts of compassion. Those were signs of his messianic ministry, but they were always secondary uh, in importance. The preaching of the gospel was always the most important thing that Jesus did in his ministry. And when he comes to proclaim the gospel, the gospel of the kingdom, the people reject it. And by rejecting it, they are, in essence, rejecting him. Now, you might be thinking, why even include such a detail as this story in the gospels? I mean, this is a weird thing, you know, that he goes home and the people reject him. Doesn't such a story undermine his credentials as Messiah? I mean, the people who knew him and grew up with him refused to follow him. Well, actually, I don't think it does. I think it actually strengthens Jesus' credentials. See, the writers of the Gospels, they show us, I think they show us that people are really no different then as they are today. Uh, for some people, there's no amount of miracles that you can give them. There's no amount of truth that you can proclaim. They will just absolutely reject it all, even if it comes from the mouth of Jesus himself. I think it's here because the historical narratives about Jesus' life, that is the Gospels, excuse me, are true. And the writers, they're not afraid to report inconvenient truths about Jesus' life, how he was looked at and treated by others. And if the Gospels are true, then you know what? They can stand scrutiny. They can stand questions. The, the Gospel writers never try to create this airtight kind of uh, defense or presentation of Jesus. They just say, here he is. Here's who he says he was. Here's what he did. Here's who we believe he is. Here's all the other details. You believe it or not. And while it is true that there were many people who did not believe him, in him during his earthly ministry. Jesus is a prophet is with honor except in his own hometown and among his family. You'll notice that among his family. 
That was true. His own family did not receive him as the Messiah until he rose from the dead. And once your brother rises from the dead, that sort of changes everything. You read in Acts chapter 1, the time of his ascension, the Scripture says that in the upper room, among them, the disciples and others, is Mary and his brothers and his sisters. And then his brother James becomes the leader in the church of Jerusalem, writes the epistle with the title James. Eventually, his family sees that he is indeed the Messiah, and they are followers of him. Well, as we study the study this brief passage of Scripture, maybe this passage, again, maybe it surprises you. I mean, how could people know Jesus and not follow him? Well, I think it's it's exactly what we said. there's There's a familiarity that breeds contempt. There's a prejudice against Jesus that keeps the people from entering the kingdom. But I think there's a dangerously different kind of familiarity with Jesus that we must resist. And for American Christians, it's that we become apathetic with the truth. Everywhere you look in our society, we have have, um, opportunities for growth. We have never lived in an age like we live in right now. The Bible is literally at your fingertips. It's on your phone. It's in the pew in front of you. You probably have multiple copies of it in your house. If you want to do a Bible study on a topic, all you got to do is do a web search. We have books upon books in our libraries. We have digital books on our phones and our, our computers and our, our, our um, tablets. We have never lived in, a, in an age like this one where you have access to good Bible teaching. It's online. It's on your TV. It's everywhere you can look. You want to you wanna learn from a teacher that lives in Israel? You don't have to order the cassettes or the VHS tapes or whatever like we used to do by, way back in the, the dinosaur days. No, you just go online, and there it is right before you. You want to order something physical? You can get it here overnighted from China. I mean, this is an amazing age that we live in. And it's very easy for us to become apathetic about the things of God. Many of us in this room have been Christians for a long time. You you might have been raised even in a Christian home. I I see this this particular apathy that I'm talking about, this boredom with spiritual things. I see this as a particular problem in Christian schools and among Christians who have gone to Christian colleges. You, You start taking certain things for granted. You're, you're well-versed in, in the facts and the stories of the Bible, but you're no longer captivated by them. You are bored with Jesus. Every church I've pastored, I've seen kids and adults and grandparents who are bored with Jesus. Been there, done that, heard that. You've heard the gospel so many times, it's, just, it's not good news, it's just old news to you. And when we gather, you, you go through the motions of worship, but you don't feel anything. If you sing, and that is the big if, because a lot of people, frankly, don't sing in the church today. But if you sing, a lot of us, we, our lips barely move, and our hearts are cold. You don't want to read your Bible. You don't want to pray. It's all become formulistic, just taken for granted. You are treating sacred things as common. You have become casual with what is holy. But brothers and sisters, let me suggest to you this morning, and not just suggest, let me declare to you that Jesus demands better than that from you and from me. His love and sacrifice for us, His promises in the age to come, the fact that our sins are forgiven. Have you read the book of Hebrews that Christ sacrifices once for all, past, present, future sins are covered under the atoning work of His blood? Have you read that lately and reminded your heart of that truth? By the grace of God, we need to shake ourselves out of our slumber. this, This sin requires us to repent and once again see the Lord high and lifted up with, with eyes that see His beauty and His glory. Get fresh eyes this morning. Come to God and say, God, forgive me. God, forgive me for just being apathetic. Forgive me for the the boredom that I have allowed to enter my heart. Forgive me for treating holy things as common. And give me a heart that's tender once again and eyes that are fresh to see and ears that are keen to hear. 
Secondly, there's a, I think there's a, a familiarity that breeds contempt that we can experience is similar to what Jesus experienced. You, you might go through this when you leave this church, and this, this service, and go home in your house. Or it might be when you go back home to your hometown that you grew up in. You know, at this point in your life, you, you might be accomplished. You might be educated. You have a, a special title where you work. People call you boss or doctor, so-and-so. But when you return home, you're just little Jimmy. You know, you're just little Jenny. That boy, that girl that they watch grow up. And none of your titles and none of your accomplishments and none of your degrees and your big fat bank account, none of that stuff impresses them. And often even our faith in Christ impresses them less. Many of us have family members who are rejecting the gospel. And so when you go to talk about your faith, they, they don't take you seriously. And they often remind you of all your past sins, all the things that you did growing up. And now you're getting holier than now, and now you're preaching to me. And, and what do they want to do? They want to somehow bring you down a couple of notches because you're not, that, you're not that holy, and you're not that clean, and you're not that different from me. That's what they're saying. But I just want to encourage you this morning, you can't let those kinds of attitudes and tactics discourage you or frustrate you from living your life on mission and speaking the gospel to others. The world needs to hear the truth, and we are called to proclaim it. We are called to live out the gospel among this world, and that first and primarily starts with your family. And so maybe this morning you're just struggling in this area. I want to just encourage you, come this morning to... to Go to Christ in prayer this morning and, and come to him and say, Lord, give me strength. This is, you, you don't, you, Lord, you know what it's like to live with this man or you know what it's like to live with my wife who's, who is an unbeliever. You know what it's like when I go back home and I see those people and, and they remind me of all the stuff I did and, and maybe even invite me to join back in with them. You, you know what that's like. Maybe it's a source of temptation and discouragement even for you. But I invite you to bring all of that to, to Jesus today and come and find grace. Grace for what seems to be the impossible. He will give it to you. And your family, your family needs your witness. And you can't punt on that. Let's pray. Father, this morning, God, help us, stir us, Lord. Quicken us to get beyond our, our treatment of what's holy as common. Convict us, Lord, when we do this. Help us to see how we are doing this right now. And God, help us to, to shake ourselves by your grace out of our slumber that we will no longer be like Nadab and Abihu where we take great things for granted, where we treat what is sacred as common. Forgive us, Lord, for our, our familiarity with Jesus and the gospel. Stir us, Lord. Stir our hearts to feel, our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our feet and our hands to act. God, may we once again fall in love with you, Lord. I pray, break, break, down, break up the fallow ground of our hearts, Lord, so that you can do a good work in us. And help us, help us to be strong witnesses for you, to not allow the discouragement of others, to, the criticism of, of others, people reminding us of our sinful past, all of those sorts of things to keep us from speaking the gospel and living the gospel before the people that we love. Give us the grace to do it. We pray for you to save those that we love, our brothers, our sisters, our, our mothers, our fathers, our husbands, our wives. Save the ones that we love. Help us to live the gospel before them faithfully. Open their hearts, God, to receive your love. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.